Okay, thank you everybody who's joining us this evening. Um, we are doing female nutrition, um, but specifically for cycling. And so um, welcome to all of you who joined. My name is Pam Julian. I'm the president and CEO of Ontario Cycling. And this is the, the first webinar in our series um, to finish off the last two weeks of Women's Month. So I hope everyone's been enjoying the profiles and all the stuff we've been doing. It was such a pleasure to do it and pull it all together and learn and the stories were just amazing. And so was the actual, um, the outpouring of people wanting to be part of this. So it was wonderful. So tonight we have Alida uh, Iocobalis, I believe, if, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, joining us from the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. Um, Alida is a registered dietitian and a sport nutritionist who works out of the velodrome in Milton at Canadian Sport Institute, which is otherwise known as CSIO. They are the, um, the training side of the athlete support system um, for our Canadian and provincial athletes from nutrition to mental health to physical sport and condition, sport and um, strength and conditioning. So they do everything there. Um, she, in addition to her work with the athletes at CSIO, she runs a virtual private practice and she supports people with disordered eating, intuitive eating and weight neutral um, nutrition interventions. And she also runs an in-person meal prep course, so uh, clicking classes. So really excited to have Alita here tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to her. We do have our Q&A, so please feel free to put any questions you have in there. I'll be monitoring it for Alita, and after her presentation, we'll have lots of time for a Q&A and for any questions you may have. Um, if you want to raise your hand instead of typing it in the chat, please feel free to raise your hand, and again, I'll be supporting Alita in this and, and monitoring in the background. So Alita, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm looking forward to learning from you tonight. Thanks so much, Pam. Really appreciate the introduction. Always, uh, always nice to have. Um, really excited to be here with everyone tonight talking about nutrition for female cyclists. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a bit of a slide presentation we'll go through together. And as Pam already mentioned, we'll definitely have time for questions at the end. So um, if you want to pop those in the chat or just make a note of them, um, we will get to those um, towards the end of the session tonight. All right. So welcome to Foundations of High Performance Nutrition. Um, tonight, we are going to be covering the nutrition habits that will help you build a strong foundation for success as a cyclist. I'm really glad to be here with you all, and my hope is that you will leave this session with a willingness to implement something new that you pick up tonight, something new that you learn. Maybe be willing to try a bit of an experiment, if you will, and be curious about how some of the things that you're going to learn tonight might impact your health and performance. So in this session, you will learn what high performance sport nutrition is and how it's different from general nutrition, how to um, use, how to build a solid nutrition foundation that will help make you a better cyclist and a more consistent athlete. And the three most important nutrition habits that you can focus your attention on to optimize your performance. All right, so let's get started. That's a bit of the game plan and now we'll get into it. Okay, so to set the stage, I wanted to spend a bit of time just making sure we're all on the same page about how nutrition for athletes is different from nutrition for the general population. Um, and also one thing that they have in common. So the first difference between the two approaches is that compared to general nutrition, sport nutrition is a more prescriptive approach and requires more, a little more structure. Um, so what this means is that to unlock your full potential as an athlete, you need to be paying attention to the types of foods that you're consuming and the timing of your, your nutrition through the day. And a more prescriptive approach to nutrition also means aiming to consume a certain amount of food through the day to match your training volume, instead of just relying on hunger and fullness cues um, to tell you when to eat or your fullness cues to tell you when to stop eating. So in other words, there may be some times when you're not really hungry, um, could be after a long day of training, sometimes that reduces our appetite. Um, there could be other reasons for low appetite like stress, anxiety, 
Um, but just when, just because we're feeling that lack of appetite doesn't necessarily mean that we don't need nutrition to be coming in. Um, sport nutrition also requires a lot of planning ahead. So see here we have on this slide, it's prescriptive and planned. So we'll talk about the planning ahead piece a little bit here. And just with the demands of your training and your busy schedules, um, trying to get by with a more intuitive or go with the flow approach to nutrition often results in under fueling and poor recovery practices. So the planning and preparation is even more important, I would say, for athletes just because of how busy you can be, um, because the nutrition tends to get away from us a little bit um, when those plans aren't in place. And that can look different for everybody. It doesn't, not everyone needs a super rigid plan or a super structured plan. Some people really thrive with that. Others need a plan with a bit more flexibility. So it's just about finding um, a rhythm and a routine that works best for you. The second difference between the two nutrition approaches is that um, athletes need to consume larger portions of carbohydrates and larger portions of protein foods compared to the general population. So higher energy expenditure requires higher energy intake and carbohydrate foods do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to meeting your energy intake requirements. So these foods are really efficient at providing quick, easy to use energy, um, and sufficient carbohydrate intake is also essential for replenishing energy that is used during training so that your body can properly recover and prevent early fatigue and muscle cramps, just to name a few of the outcomes of, of underfueling, especially with carbohydrates. Protein, on the other hand, is really important for building and repairing muscle, which is needed to increase strength and power. And in particular, attention should be paid to ensuring adequate protein intake quickly after strength training to help your body recover properly and prevent excessive muscle soreness. So we've gone over a couple differences so far. So I wanted to get to... Um, the one thing that they have in common, these approaches when we're comparing um, nutrition for athletes compared to nutrition for, um, high, for, for the general public. So the one thing that sport nutrition and general nutrition have in common is that they are inclusive of all foods. So just like the general population, athletes should prioritize taste, flexibility, enjoyment, and fun when it comes to food. And eating like an athlete does not mean that certain foods need to be off limits. In fact, foods that are often not associated with an athlete's diet, like sugars or processed foods, can in fact be important and convenient fuel sources. Trying to avoid sugars and processed foods altogether requires you to remove a lot of nutritious and convenient options from your diet, and it often becomes very difficult to consume enough total energy um, when you're cutting all of these foods out. So for this reason, high performance athletes should take an all foods fit approach and include as much variety in their diet as possible, not only for its positive effects on mental health, but also on fueling and performance. All right, let's zoom out a bit and ooh, take a look at the big picture when it comes to sport nutrition. So I don't know if this is familiar to some of you or not, but this is the sport nutrition pyramid, as we like to call it. Um, and it's an overview of all of the different nutrition strategies that you can implement as an athlete to maintain your health and enhance your performance. So we'll go through, we'll work from the bottom all the way up to the top. At the base of the pyramid is food. So this will be the foundation of all fueling strategies for good health and performance. This level includes building balanced meals and snacks, uh, meal and snack timing, meal planning, adjusting your fueling based on where you're at in your yearly training plan, also known as periodization. Um, this level also would cover pre and post workout fueling and recovery and competition nutrition planning. The three nutrition habits that we're gonna be learning about today um, are based on the first level of this pyramid, okay? As you progress past the first level, you'll learn about incorporating sport foods. So these are foods that have been specifically formulated and designed for athletes, such as gels and sport drinks, just to name a few examples. And then as we work our way to the very tippy top of the pyramid, the final level is supplements, which can be a component of food, an isolated nutrient, 
or non-food compound that is taken in addition to a regular diet with the aim of achieving a specific health and or performance benefit. So examples of supplements could include vitamin and mineral supplements like iron or vitamin D. Um, supplements also would encompass things like protein powders, caffeine, um, and creatine. There's so, so many supplements out there. So that is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but just um, a couple examples of commonly used ones um, by athletes. So one thing I want to just point out about the pyramid is that the size of the different levels of the pyramid, so the amount of space that each one takes up, is matches the size of the impact that these tools will have on performance and health. So in other words, taking the time to build a really strong um, foundation with food will result in a significantly larger positive impact on your health and performance as compared to the one to 2% advantage that athletes can expect to get from safe supplement use. So it's really worth putting in the time and effort and, and building your knowledge and having a really solid understanding of um, all the different ways that we can use food to optimize, to leverage um, our, our success and our, our performance as athletes, because that, that level of the pyramid is really where we're gonna get the biggest return on investment. So what do you have to gain from taking the time to focus on building a strong foundation with food first nutrition? By understanding what your priorities are when it comes to fueling, you stand to gain more frequent and consistent positive training adaptations, such as increased strength, power, and speed. You'll also notice better energy, which will enable you to have higher quality training sessions more consistently, and you'll be less likely to get sick um, or injured. And if you do get sick or injured, you will be able to recover more quickly and return to training sooner. So lots and lots of benefits here, lots of things to gain um, from taking the time to build this food first foundation and make it as strong as you possibly can. And when it comes to fueling, doing the simple things, doing them well, and doing them consistently will really help your progress as an athlete look more like the graph in green on the right, which represents slow and steady progress in a positive direction. Whereas the lack of attention to building that strong foundation will result in your progress looking a little bit more like the graph in red on the left, um, where you'll be stuck in a really frustrating cycle of feeling like you're always taking a few steps forward, followed by a few steps back. So with that introduction in place, with our foundation laid for the session for tonight, um, I'll get to our first priority, priority number one when it comes to high performance nutrition habits, which is adequacy. Um, and it's the first priority because it is the most important. And because it is the most important, we're going to be spending most of our time on this one tonight. So what do I mean when I say you should be prioritizing adequacy with your nutrition what this means is eating enough to support healthy body functioning in addition to the energy demands of your training. Adequacy with your nutrition is the first and most important priority because it will reduce the risk of you entering a state of low energy availability. This happens when there isn't enough nutrition left over to support your physical and mental health after what is needed for your training has been used up. Ensuring you're eating enough on a daily basis supports both your overall health and your performance on the bike. Eating enough will support optimal hormone health, bone health, and digestive health, as well as immune function and mental well-being. So you can see that list of health supports on the left side of the screen as it relates to energy availability. Um, it also is necessary to support gains in lean mass and strength, improved glycogen stores to enable increased speed, power, and endurance, faster recovery, and will also help prevent injury. So you can see um, the impact of, you know, adequate fueling to stay in adequate energy availability has a lot of very far-reaching effects, not only for physical and mental health, but definitely as that relates to performance, very real impacts. And on the flip side of things, when we are not eating adequately and we're in that state of low energy availability, all of these things also get negatively affected in the process. On the topic of hormone health, since we just covered um, how that is impacted by the adequacy of our nutrition 
Commission and our state of energy availability. I wanted to spend a few moments highlighting the impacts of a healthy menstrual cycle on athletic performance for those that are of an age where they are menstruating. One of the many side effects of low energy availability in women is low estrogen, which can lead to periods becoming lighter, irregular, or potentially stopping altogether. So I wanted to highlight two really interesting studies for those of you who really like the research. One which showed that athletes who have a regular period are faster than their peers who do not. So this study was done in swimmers and it compared their speeds before and after a 12 week training program. Um, and as you can see here, um, the results showed that the athletes who did have a regular period got faster over that 12 week training period and the ones who did not, their times actually decreased, they got, sorry, the times increased, they got slower, okay? Um, and this is a second study. This one is done in endurance athletes, which showed um, that muscle endurance is 20% lower and muscle strength is 11% lower in athletes with missing periods compared to those that have regular periods. So um, this is very related to that whole energy availability um, piece that we just covered. Um, really your period is a sign that things, having a regular healthy period is a sign that things are where they should be in terms of energy availability. It's not um, diagnostic at all. Like if, if things are off with your cycle, it could be a lot of different things underlying, but one of the things to just be aware of, especially for really active females is um, the impact that training load is having on your ability to um, fully adequately nourish yourself. And sometimes when we're, when that, that is present, that low energy availability, as soon as we correct that um, deficit, it does really kind of help your, your body functioning. Those systems kind of kick back into, into regular functioning. So there's many reasons and explanations for why athletes end up under fueling. I've already mentioned busy schedules being a really, um, you know, key reason why we need to be planning ahead so much as athletes to keep on top of fueling, because we often have very little time and energy for meal planning and preparation, um, just trying to keep up with not only your training, but other commitments you have in life. Um, food insecurity is also on the rise, especially with the rising cost of food, making access to adequate nourishment increasingly challenging for some people. And then there are also expectations from both society and sport culture, which can put pressure on women to achieve a certain body aesthetic, um, leading to restricted energy intake. Eating disorders can also contribute, contribute to low energy availability and are more common in athletes than the general population. So definitely something to be aware of. Um, and whether intentional or unintentional, all of these things can lead you to a place of energy deficiency. And when you're in this state over a long period of time, it leads to all of the different negative impacts on health and performance that we touched on a few slides back. So if you're hearing all of this and wondering if you may be experiencing low energy availability, you can use these questions here to perform a bit of a self-assessment. And um, the, this self-assessment is available on the link that I shared with Pam that's going to be um, distributed to everyone. So no need to like write this down I'm in a hurry. You will have access to it. But we'll just go over some of the questions together. Um, so asking yourself, do I feel tired all the time, even after, you know, I've had a good long sleep or I've, I've been well rested and am I still kind of feeling fatigued? Am I excessively sore and feeling like I can't quite recover between training sessions? Is my performance failing to improve at the rate of, you know, that my coaches are expecting or that I'm expecting of myself? Is my mood low or fluctuating? Have I had reoccurring injuries in the last year? Um, especially if you've ever had a stress, a stress fracture, that can be um, a sign that energy availability might need to be looked at. Are you frequently getting ill or sick? And um, tying it back to the menstrual cycle, is my menstrual cycle irregular or lighter than normal or possibly missing? Okay, so please note that this is not a diagnostic tool. Um, and that if you answer yes to any of these questions, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem with energy availability. If you do answer yes to one or more of these questions, I would recommend connecting with a sport dietitian who can just help you assess um, your intake and your energy needs and um, kind of guide you in the right direction in terms of whether, you know, 
nutrition is something that could be contributing to some of these things. But as you might suspect, a lot of these things that you might answer yes to could have other underlying causes that have little to do with nutrition. So that's why it's really important to consult with an expert before you kind of jump into action or get worried about anything is just to make sure that you're getting assessed um, so that we can get some more clarity on what direction to head with a treatment plan. So as we wrap up um, this first section on ensuring adequate nutrition intake, I want to spend a few minutes discussing what enough is when it comes to fuel, because it's one thing to say, make sure you're eating enough, but what does that really mean? So adequate nutrition is highly individual. And what this means is that what is enough food for one athlete may be insufficient for another, even when other variables such as sport, age, um, and training schedule are equal. Okay, so as a starting point, it's a good practice to aim for three complete meals every day. Um, that means having more than just coffee for breakfast. Coffee doesn't count as a meal. Absolutely have it if it's something you enjoy and helps wake you up in the morning, but make sure you're actually having a complete meal alongside of that beverage. In addition to your regular meals, you will need to be eating at least two to three snacks a day. Um, and all meals and snacks should include a source of carbohydrate while meals should always include at least 20 grams of protein each. We also want to um, consider fluids when talking about adequacy. So you should be drinking fluids um, with every meal throughout and throughout the day to stay on top of hydration. As a bare minimum, be aiming to complete at least two liters of fluids um, daily. Many of you will need considerably more than this, though, depending on, on body size and sweat rate, which again are highly individual. So what I want you to note about this slide and the information here about what is enough, how to stay out of low energy availability, is that these guidelines are to be taken as a absolute bare minimum. Some of you may need a lot more food, nutrition than in than what's outlined on this slide to stay out of low energy availability. And if you're, again, if you're ever unsure of whether you're eating enough, um, it doesn't hurt to consult with a sport dietitian who can provide you with an assessment of your individual needs because there's so many factors that can affect um, how much energy you're needing to really fully nourish and take care of yourself and fuel your body. Um, so if you're ever unsure about that, and it's normal to be unsure of that because of all of the conflicting nutrition information that we have out there on top of those um, societal pressures, sport culture pressures that I mentioned earlier. So if you're feeling unsure about it, you're definitely not alone in that. Um, and there is support available if you are seeking that. So there are some small changes that you can make to increase your energy intake that can add up to making a big difference if we're doing them consistently. So I'll just run through some of the examples here. Um, if you're struggling to eat enough and you're already fairly confident that you could use some more energy through your day. Um, so one thing that's a pretty easy switch that I like to remind people of since these milk alternatives are becoming or have become really popular. Lots of people I speak with are using like almond milk and oat milk, which are you know great and have their place. Um, they are very low in energy and very low in protein. In fact, they, those almond and oat milk for sure don't have much protein at all. So an easy swap, if you can tolerate dairy milk, okay, is to swap switch to regular dairy milk because it's got, again, a bit more energy and a lot more protein in it. Um, or if you can't tolerate dairy or you um, just choose to eat more plant-based, the best plant-based alternative for a milk would be soy milk, again, because it has the um, protein content there that is missing in, in almond and oat milks and other um, plant-based milk alternatives. Another just quick thing, like if you're using other dairy like yogurt, um, there's lots of fat-free yogurt on the market. The, the yogurt section of the grocery store is quite overwhelming with all the choices these days, but um, you know, switching to like a 1% or 2% or even a higher milk fat percentage yogurt is a great way to add some extra energy in without really changing, you know, what you're eating or how you're eating it. Um, so that's a pretty easy swap as well. And with adding fat to foods, we're also increasing the amount of fat soluble vitamins that we're able to absorb from that food. So um, there's definitely nothing to be afraid of with those added fats, they actually do help um, us absorb some nutrition as well. 
And things like snacking, if you're ever snacking on like fruit or veggies, a great thing to get in the habit of is adding to that snack of fruit or veggies, like some kind of dip, again, probably has some added fats to help us absorb more vitamins and minerals from those veggies, but also adds energy and satisfaction as well. So very important or nuts or cheese or something like that would also be great to add to like a just plain fruit or veggie snack to boost up the energy intake as well. Okay. Uh, um, oh, Alita, Alita, we actually have a question that yeah. uh, with regards to the slide, um, uh, somebody has asked, uh, surprised to see replacement for water. Can you comment mm. on number of servings or cups per day to keep as water? Yes. Um, great question. So we have to remember that when it comes to hydration, um, all fluids count. So most fluids like milk juice included are like 90% water anyways. So that kind of helps put things into perspective when there might be like some fear around the other things that are in there like sugars or carbohydrates. Um, so like I said earlier, just like with um, energy intake, fluid intake is going to be highly individual too based on body size, sweat rate, et cetera. Um, I said before, like two liters minimum for sure, um, for everybody is probably pretty safe. Um, so, you know, if you can get, you know, at least a liter, liter and a half of that as water, that's, that's great. Um, and the rest can come from some other fluids like, um, tea and coffee also count as well. You know, they used to be kind of not counted because of the caffeine making them a diuretic, but, um, the more, recent literature has shown that that diuretic effect isn't actually as um, substantial as we once thought it was. So by no means do I want you to get all of your hydration through coffee and tea, um, but having, you know, a cup or two is totally fine and can count towards your, your fluid intake as well. So where I'm coming from with the, you know, doing some more milk juice sport drink instead of just drinking water is especially for people who are not able to eat enough, low appetite, it's really hard to add more solid food to their day, getting the extra energy in from um, beverages that have calories in them is a pretty easy and effective way to get that energy in without adding to fullness. Anything else for questions for now? No. Okay, we will keep going. Okay, so you might remember that I made special mention of increased intake of protein and carbohydrates earlier when defining the features of nutrition for high performance sport. So when it comes to protein, many different foods can provide us with this nutrient. However, some foods are going to offer it in a higher concentration than others. Um, so just take a look. I've got a spectrum here for you. Um, take a look at where some of the different protein foods fall. Um, so on the high end of the spectrum, which is on our left hand side, we have a lot of our animal based protein sources, all of our meats. So like chicken, beef, pork, fish would be here. Um, and then dairy and tofu are kind of right up there too. So cottage cheese, very high source of protein, um, yogurt, especially Greek yogurt, very high as well. And tofu for a plant based option would be high up there as well. Moving more into the middle, the moderate protein zone, we have milk, cheese, we have some beans, eggs here as well. And then on the low end, so moving to the far right, we have things like cream cheese, peanut butter, and hummus. Again, this is not exhaustive. Not every protein food is on here, but I tried to just include some common examples. If you have um, a question about a protein food that's not on here, please let me know. I'm happy to kind of give you an idea of where it might fall on here. Um, but the reason that I've put it this way and outlined, put everything on a spectrum instead of like a hierarchy, for example, um, is to show that all of these foods provide a benefit for us. It's just about knowing how to use them in different scenarios. So the high protein foods aren't necessary, necessarily better or healthier for us, just like the low protein foods aren't worse or less healthy for us. They just need to be used at different times. So Remember when I mentioned with adequacy, um, we need to be making sure we're getting at least 20 grams of protein at every meal. So your higher protein foods are going to be really effective at helping you meet that target without having to try too hard. So 20 grams of protein in chicken is like half a chicken breast. It's not much at all. 
Um, you can absolutely have more than 20 grams worth of protein. That's not a problem, but we just want to make sure we're hitting that bare minimum at least. You can also hit 20 grams of protein with your moderate protein foods. So more of the plant-based sources, you just need to be having larger portions of them. Okay. The one thing that's probably not going to be effective for mealtime to hit the 20 grams is your your low concentration protein food. So relying on like just a peanut butter sandwich or just a bagel with cream cheese and that's your only protein is you're probably not gonna hit the 20 gram mark. But what you can do is combine foods from the different zones. So let's say for breakfast, you wanna have um, like some peanut butter toast. Maybe you're also having yogurt with that on the side to help get you up to the 20 grams, right? So we can definitely get hit our protein targets from multiple different foods added together. It doesn't just have to come from one source, but this is just to kind of give you the knowledge to empower you to make those choices and identify, hey, if I want to have like a salad that has hummus in it, that's great, but I probably need to be adding another protein food to that meal somewhere else so that I'm getting enough. Um, and regardless of where the different protein foods fall on the spectrum, important to know that they're all really great sources of iron, vitamin D, B12, and zinc, which are really important for immune health and oxygen transport. So lots of benefits, again, no matter where these fall on the spectrum, they're all useful. They all can um, help us reach our goals in terms of health and performance. Just important to know when to use them and where. So we'll go through the same thing for carbs because those are the other food group that we need to pay really close attention to getting enough as athletes. So just like with the protein foods, the higher density carbohydrate foods are going to be more effective at meeting our carbohydrate needs at meals and directly before training or competition. Those are the two times where these are going to be really important. While the lower carbohydrate foods are perfect options for snacks. So of note, you'll see vegetables are on the very low end um, of the spectrum here. This is something I always like to point out because I've heard a lot of misconception around, you know, when I ask people, you know, what they eat for carbohydrates, people will often list like lots of vegetables. And while that is fantastic, obviously there's so many benefits to getting lots of veggies in. They are really not a significant source of carbohydrate, except the starchy ones like potatoes. Those would be the exception. But pretty much everything else um, has carb. It definitely doesn't have any protein or fat. That's why we call it a carb kind of by default, because that is the only macronutrient group present in vegetables, but it is by no means a high carbohydrate food. So we definitely want to keep the colorful fruit and veg in your diet, but we also need to be supplementing that with some higher concentration carbohydrate foods, because those are the ones that are going to do more of the heavy lifting. And especially in a population that has elevated carbohydrate needs, it's not going to be possible to meet those needs just relying on veggies for the carbs alone. Okay. And again, regardless of where the different carbohydrates food, carbohydrate foods fall on the spectrum, they're all a great source of fiber. You're going to get antioxidants from all of these, a lot of vitamin C as well. And these are all going to be really important for reducing inflammation um, and improving immune health and digestive health as well. So you'll see some of the higher density carb foods. We have things like baked goods, muffins, um, tortillas, any bread product really um, pasta, rice, fruit juices will be higher in carbs, more concentrated in carbs than whole fruit. Um, beans are also on here. So this is one food that was on both the protein and the carbohydrate spectrum. And that's because most beans are about a 50-50 split of carbohydrate and protein, which makes sense given what we were talking about earlier about beans, um, ne needing to have a much larger portion of beans to get your protein needs met compared to chicken, because where the chicken is 100%, almost 100% protein and a little bit of fat, the beans are like 50% protein and 50% carb. So it doesn't make one better or worse than the other. It's just knowing how to use them um, to get your needs met. Okay, so that wraps up our first of our three nutrition priorities. We'll now move on to priority number two, which is frequency. So this means eating at regular intervals throughout the day to manage our energy levels and ensure timely pre and post training fueling. So focusing on eating frequently through the day also happens to support the first priority of adequacy, 
because working to fill any long gaps in your days between meals and snacks will automatically reduce also at the same time your risk of underfueling. Okay, so frequent eating is about keeping the gaps between meals and snacks short. Ideally, you should be aiming to eat something every two to four hours through the day, starting from your first meal of the day, which should be happening no longer than an hour after you wake up. If you find that you are going five to six hours between eating, you're probably not eating frequently enough to meet your nutrition needs and best support your training. So you'll see a timeline here, sample day. Um, I'm sure all of you train at slightly different times. So I just stuck the ride in the middle of the day. So feel free to adjust this depending on your individual schedule. But let's say, you know, you wake up around 6 a.m. by 7 a.m. at the latest, you're having your breakfast. So let's say we have a smoothie. The smoothie has got some milk in it that has some protein, maybe also some yogurt fruit for a little bit of carbohydrate, and then um, a more heavy hitting carbohydrate food like a bagel. Maybe you have some butter or cream cheese or peanut butter on there, whatever tastes good to you. Um, so we're having a, a more substantial meal. We've got a carb, we've got color, we've got protein, we've got our bases covered. And then a few hours later, around 10, we're maybe having a snack. We're going to try to pair that protein and carb again together, just in a smaller portion than maybe you would have at a meal. So we've got a muffin and maybe a yogurt. And then um, 1 p.m., a few hours later, so three hours later, we're having lunch. So we maybe have a sandwich um, that's got some meat on there, veggies, some added fat, some kind of spread of some sort. Um, and we've got a couple sides with the sandwich because the sandwich, most sandwiches aren't enough energy on their own to really um, provide enough calories for a meal for most athletes. So make sure we're having sides um, with something like that as well. And then um, we do our ride kind of after lunch, we give ourselves an hour or so to digest. And we're making sure that we're bringing enough fluids and snacks with us on that ride if it's going to be longer than an hour. Um, so, you know, at, at least 250 mils per hour that you plan to be training is good for fluids. And you can do a combination of sport drink and water. The sport drink is going to be more important if your rides are any longer than 90 minutes. Anything shorter than that, you can probably get away with just water. That doesn't necessarily mean that you won't feel better or perform better with a bit of sport drink added, but that's a personal choice. And then snack wise, I've got little granola bars here, but you know, you could be using gels, you could be using dried fruit, whatever it is that you like to have with you on longer rides to um, stay on top of those carbohydrate needs. You want to plan to have one of those kinds of snacks for about every hour that you plan to um, be on the bike. Okay, so that's our intra training fueling. And then right after we're done, we want to work to get that recovery nutrition in as fast as we can. So thinking about timing here, of if you have to do any kind of traveling to wherever it is that you're doing your ride, and it's longer than it's going to take you longer than 30 minutes to get home, then you need to be bringing your recovery nutrition with you so that you can get that in in a timely manner. So as an example, I have chocolate milk here, which really is a great recovery nutrition food because it's got your bases covered, it's fluid. It's got protein and it's got carbohydrate in a very usable, easy form, which is sugar. So nothing to be afraid of. It's actually very helpful, um, easy for your body to use and digest. So that's one example. You could like make yourself a yogurt parfait if you want to do kind of a little bit more whole foods. Um, so granola, fruit, yogurt would also cover your bases for protein and carb for recovery. And then, of course, add your fluid on the side. Um, and then a few hours later, we're having a full dinner meal. Um, again, good amount of carbohydrate, some kind of color, whether it's fruit or veg and some protein. And then three hours later, we're having a snack again before bed. So could be some peanut butter toast with banana. Um, something with a little bit of protein, again, is usually helpful. You're about to fast for eight, nine hours, however long it is that you're going to be sleeping. And so giving your body some protein to kind of work on um, through that time is, is really helpful. Okay. So we'll zoom in um, a little bit here on the frequency piece in terms of the timeline for fueling before, during, and after training. Um, so you can see here, like 30 to 60 minutes before any kind of training session, any kind of ride, we want to be giving our body some really 
quick, easy to digest carbohydrate fuel, because that's what it's going to need the most of um, that's easily accessible for you to be burning on your ride. So again, we have examples here of a muffin. Maybe you do some toast, maybe you do some fruit or a combination of these things. Um, and you want to give yourself at least 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes to digest that. So we're not getting any kind of uncomfortable stomach cramping when we're exerting ourselves. That's another reason why you want to stick with just simple carbohydrate foods before training is because they are the quickest digesting. They're quicker than proteins, quicker than fats for sure. Um, and the simpler the carb, the better. So we don't want to generally be messing around with really high fiber stuff um, in the hour leading up to exercise because that is a bit harder on our gut. And anytime we're exercising, our blood flow is being diverted away from our digestive system um, um, and towards our heart and our lungs and our muscle where the energy and the oxygen is needed. And what that results in is digestion slowing down. And so you don't want a bunch of food in your gut sitting there without the blood flow to digest it because that's what starts to cause some really uncomfortable digestion. So simple carbs, the simpler the better. That means refined carbs, white carbs, nothing too high fiber in the hour leading up for best to feel your best. And then we talked about the 250 mils plus one snack per hour um, for your ride. Um, and again, this is going to be the most important for anything longer than an hour. If you're just going for an hour or less, you probably don't need to bring, you know, bring water with you for sure, but you probably don't need to bring um, much in terms of the fuel. You can just eat before and then after. Um, but for the longer rides, for sure, make sure you have more than you need because it's better to have a few extra than to run out of snacks um, before the end of your ride. And then within 30 to 60 minutes of finishing your ride, this is when we want to get our three R's of recovery in. So the first R is refuel. That's the carbohydrate portion that's going to replace the energy stores that you used up during your training session and prepare you for the next one, right? So I always like to say um, that recovery isn't just about you know, helping your body recover from what you just did. It's also the start of your preparation for your next training session. Okay, so first R is refuel with carbohydrate. Second R of recovery is rebuild with protein. Um, so this is gonna help repair those micro tears in the muscle that we all get when we're exerting ourselves, the progressive overload. Um, so that's going to help again, if we get that minimum 20 grams of protein in as soon as possible, that's really going to help reduce, um, muscle soreness. And the third R of recovery is rehydrate. So this is where your fluids and electrolytes come in. Okay. And as a bonus, um, don't worry about this one, unless you've got the first three R's really down and solid. Um, but as a bonus, adding some colorful fruit and veg to your post-training, Recovery routine will also really help with um, reducing inflammation that naturally happens with exercise. Um, so if you're already pretty solid with those three R's, you can go ahead and maybe work on adding that little bonus in um, to get just some some extra recovery in. Okay, Alita, we have a couple questions, if that's okay. Yeah, um, let's do it. The first one is, would oatmeal work before your training? Yes, I know a lot of people like to do oatmeal. So the one um, I know I said high fiber isn't usually great before training. Everyone's different. So some people have really sensitive nuts that the low fiber carb options are going to be really important for you if you have a sensitive digestive system. If you don't, if you've already been doing oatmeal and it works really well for you, there's no reason to stop doing oatmeal. It definitely has carbohydrate, which is the main priority. Um, so, and it actually isn't super high in fiber either. I would say it's more of like a low to moderate fiber food. So yes, if you do oatmeal already and it works great for you, please keep doing that. Okay, thanks, Alita. Um, and then the second question I have here is how much of each? And I'm going to assume it came through as you were talking about refuel, rebuild, rebuild and rehydrate. So I might be wrong, but I'm thinking that's might be what they're referring to. Okay, let's do that. And then if whoever asked that is asking something different, let us know. And I'll let us know. It. Yes, please. <laughs> um, so how much? So rebuild with protein. This is an easier one. Minimum 20 grams. So just the same as we talked about with minimums for like regular meals, 20 grams of protein. Same goes for recovery nutrition. 20 to 30 is kind of the sweet spot that the research is telling us that um, we need to hit. It doesn't usually help to get more than 30. Um, you don't get like better recovery by like going even higher. So 
even anywhere in that 20 to 30 gram of protein range within an hour of finishing is ideal. Um, the carbohydrate is going to vary a lot more. Um, I would say like minimum 30 to 50 grams. This one will really depend on how long your ride was. So if you're doing multiple hours, you might need like 50 to hundred grams. Um, you know, so it's real, that one's going to vary quite a lot. Um, hydration again is also going to vary a lot. It will depend on how much you were actually able to consume during your training, um, sweat rates. So that one, you kind of need a more individualized approach. There isn't really like a blanket kind of number that I can give to everyone. <laughs> That's going to be accurate. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Thanks for those questions. Yeah. Keep them coming, by the way. The chat is open. So if you've got any questions, please fire them in the Q&A or feel free to raise your hand. All right. So I wanted to give you all just a really quick, easy um, recipe here as it relates to recovery. So this one is our portable chocolate recovery shake. It tastes just like chocolate milk. However, the advantage of this one is that unlike chocolate milk, it does not require you to carry around a cooler with you to keep it at the right temperature for food safety. Um, so this is basically like a dehydrated chocolate milk that you just add water to when you're ready to drink it and it covers your recovery needs. So if you wanna try this, you can take three quarters of a cup of skim milk powder, two tablespoons of Nesquik. Don't try this with, with hot chocolate powder because it won't dissolve properly. <laughs> so Nesquik is what's needed for this one. Um, and then, so you put those two ingredients in a shaker bottle, you throw it in your bag. And then when you're ready to drink it, when you're done your session and ready for your recovery nutrition, you just add 500 mils of water, shake it up. You do not need a blender. It just dissolves in a shaker bottle. And this is going to give you 20 grams of protein and 50 grams of carbs. So it's right in that sweet spot, covers your protein needs. Um, a bit of fluid is coming in, definitely enough carbs to cover like a shorter ride, maybe not a longer ride, but you can always add some extra carb on the side of this to supplement. Um, so this is a really convenient way to get that recovery nutrition in quickly. And convenience will sometimes be really important um, when you're on the go or, you know, away um, for competition or something like that, where you maybe don't have access to you know, bringing a whole cooler worth of things with you all the time. Um, you could also, like I said before, you could do the same thing in terms of meeting your recovery needs with more whole foods. You could do Greek yogurt. You could do that with um, like yogurt and granola. That's going to require you to like do a little bit of extra planning, packing ahead and lugging some coolers around to keep things at the right temperature. But it is also an option as well. Um. And then, yeah, have, oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, before we go to balance, I do have one, another question that's come in. Um, sure. Does the refueling change at all depending on the intensity of the ride? So long, low intensity ride versus an hour, moderate, high. Yes, great question. So again, this is going to be a little bit individual. Um, depending on which system you're using more of like the aerobic versus anaerobic is going to change what fuel source you're burning, whether it's more carbs or more fats, right? So the lower intensity, lower heart rate zone training is probably for most people going to be lower in carbohydrate burning um, versus the high intensity, high heart rate zone work is definitely going to be high carbohydrate burning. So if you're at that place where you're really doing that fine tuning, then you could experiment with kind of adding extra carbs for recovery on the high intensity days and seeing if recovery is okay with a bit less carbohydrate on the lower intensity days. Um, but again, like we have seen when we do like metabolic profiles for athletes that that rule isn't always true for everybody. So you probably want to be careful with that one over generalizing more carbs is probably better than not enough carbs. So err on that side. Um, if you, if you want to be cautious. Okay, great. Thanks, Alita. No problem. Um, just one more quick, easy recovery thing. I don't know. You probably have all maybe tried cliff builder bars before. They're also a really convenient, um, food to have for recovery that covers, you get enough protein in the bar. I think they're about 30 to 50 grams of carb too. So if you're looking for another alternative, that is a good one. That's also pretty convenient. Okay. So we will wrap things up um, with our final nutrition priority for today, which is balance. 
Um, so balance is about eating a combination of foods from different food groups. It also requires us to understand how to adjust the proportion of different foods on our plate based on the volume and intensity of training. So that was a great question, great segue into this last section. Um, so in addition to helping you match your intake to your training volume, understanding balance can also help to prevent vitamin and mineral deficiencies as it requires all the different food groups to be present and accounted for. Training your eye to look for for starchy carbs, protein, and color when building meals is a great practice to get into to improve your consistency with balance. So starchy carbohydrate foods will include things like our grains and grain products, like oats, rice, cereal, um, pasta, bread, naan, um, crackers, flour, or corn tortillas would all fit in that group. Our protein foods, just for a quick refresher, are can be animal-based like our meats, fish, seafood, eggs, and dairy, or we can also do plant-based like soy, tofu, um, beans, nuts, and seeds. The color component of balance refers to fruits and vegetables. So we're just going to lump those together. Most of the color on our plate is going to come from those foods. So um, whatever combination of those that you like and prefer is totally okay. And finally, we want to look for our fat as a part of balance as well. So fats can be included as added fats, such as butter, oil, or ghee, which can often be used through the cooking process or added at the table. Fats can also be naturally found in animal proteins, such as the fats that are found in dairy or nuts. And these types of fats are referred to as hidden fats. So again, just two different types of fats. One isn't better or worse than the other. It's just different ways that they can show up in our diet. Um, so to ensure that our daily nutrition is balanced, we want to aim to get um, all four of these components in meals, at least most of the time. There's definitely going to be the odd meal here and there that's missing one or two of these things. And that is by no means the end of the world. Um, we want to have some flexibility with our nutrition. And so that means that things are going to look a little bit different day to day. And that is absolutely okay. And for snacks, we want to aim to get one to two of these components um, in there, again, most of the time. Some of your snacks may only be from one food group, and that is, again, totally okay. All right, and these are um, our athlete training plates, and they're a great way to kind of just visualize how balance and adequacy will look different day to day based on changes in your training volume and intensity. So for example, on a rest day, um, a balanced plate might have a little bit less starchy carbohydrate foods and more fruits and vegetables, as you can see with this plate on the left. On a hard training day, which could be a day where you're training twice, or you have one really long session or one really intense session, a plate that fulfills the priorities of balance. adequacy would consist of half a plate of our starchy carbohydrate foods and a quarter plate of fruits and vegetables. Golden red, those portions stay the same training day or a hard training day, which and the fruit and veggie proportion of the plate. And essentially what's happening is as the, the training intensity and volume increases, so does the proportion of starchy carbohydrates on our plate. And to make room for those extra starchy carbohydrates, we're reducing the fruits and veggies just a little bit so that we can make room for um, the more carbohydrate dense foods that we need, that we need more of. Okay. Hey, we've got another good question. It's actually one that I was going to uh, like similar that I was going to raise at the end. Um, yeah. Cause I, as someone who's postmenopausal, I was curious about the, the fueling from that um, perspective, as opposed to men, like being, having, having menses. So mm -hmm. we have a question as an older mountain biking athlete in menopause, are there any other things I should be considering with regard to nutrition? Yeah, great question. Um, I think for this kind of life stage, um, I know weight changes can be something that we deal with and can be a bit of a stressor. Um, and I've seen a lot of people kind of really become restrictive with their diets in order to kind of prevent these things from happening or they're already happening and we're trying to kind of make some changes. So just to be extra careful with that energy availability piece we were talking about. Um, 
soy products. So we were talking about like um, doing tofu as a source of protein, edamame, soy milk, for example. Um, the phytoestrogens or phytochemicals in those foods can be really beneficial. I think there was some research years ago that really scared people off of yeah. those foods. The newer, more current research has debunked that. So um, no worries about having those foods. In, in fact, they can actually be helpful for all life stages, but especially kind of postmenopausal. Um, so I would say that would be one thing that you can maybe try adding more in to support your body in this life stage and just trying not to um, become too restrictive with anything and kind of get yourself in that low energy availability state unintentionally. Thanks. No problem. Okay, so we will start to wrap up. Um, I wanted to leave you all with this um, nutrition habit tracking template. Um, this is a really good practice to get into. I often recommend athletes go through this exercise on their own every two to three months um, throughout the year. And it's kind of a simplified version of like food logging without really having to write down everything that you're eating, which can be a chore. Um, so this is a, a, like a simplified just checklist of pick a week and just check off the boxes every time you have a meal and see if there's any holes, see if there's any gaps in your week by the end of the, the week that you do this exercise. Also keep track of how many snacks you're having. Um, if you're having consistent preparation and recovery nutrition, if you're training on a certain day, you can check off those boxes. If you're not training, just scratch them out. And then also keeping track of your energy levels, so your fatigue rating. And what this does, the snapshot really will allow you to have a bird's eye view of what you're doing really well, where are you being really consistent, and where are there gaps, where are there holes, and to draw some, um, you know, put some dots together, put some puzzle pieces together around how your fueling habits are maybe impacting your energy levels, right? So if you want to do something like this, or adapt this to be a practice that um, would be helpful for you. I'd love for you to ask yourself some reflection questions. So after doing this, after collecting some data, what opportunities exist for me to be more consistent with, with my nutrition? Is there anything sticking out in terms of adequacy, frequency, or balance that, you know, maybe could use some attention or maybe could use some work? Um, what is getting in the way of me being consistent with my nutrition habits? Is it scheduling? Is it lack of planning and preparation? Is it stress? Is it fatigue? There's so many very valid, real things that we can experience that make it hard to do the things that we know we should be doing. It's not usually a lack of knowledge. It's that some barrier, some challenge is getting in the way that's making it really hard for us to do the things that we know will probably help us. And then what is one thing that I can do in the coming week to be more consistent with just one aspect of my nutrition? So I know with a lot of athletes, we tend to be overachievers, maybe a little bit perfectionistic, and it's part of what makes us good at our sport. Um, but it can also lead us to being a little overambitious with behavior change and goal setting. And that can tend to um, kind of self-sabotage a little bit where we set out to do too much, maybe more than we need to. And in doing that, because it's too much and overwhelming, we end up not doing anything at all. That's very all or nothing mindset, right? So I really challenge you to set a goal, just one, and keep it really small and keep it really specific. Just work on that thing until that becomes easy second nature before you go on and add anything else complicated to, to the goal setting. All right. Okay, so quick summary, and we'll have a few minutes for any last questions, but I have been loving the ones that have been coming in so far. So in summary, high performance nutrition habits require planning and preparation to meet your needs for adequate energy and frequent and balanced meals and snacks. These things don't usually happen when we're just kind of going with the flow, unfortunately. Consistency with your nutrition habits will lead to optimal health and improved performance, so don't underestimate um, the value of doing the simple things, doing them well, and doing them consistently. We really don't need to get really fancy with nutrition at all. Um, usually it's some really basic things that need some fine tuning. That's really what's going to get you feeling better and performing better. So don't overthink it. And finally, don't let the learning process end here. Apply the concepts covered and
in this, um, this session to your daily life by tracking your nutrition habits, just to provide yourself with some insight and accountability. And this will really help you identify some gaps and guide effective goal setting so that you can measure your progress. All right, that is it for me tonight. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll have my email here, but if anyone misses it, um, I'll, Pam, feel free to, to pass on my email if anyone has questions. Of course. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, it's great to, great to see you all. Okay, well, we've, we've got some questions that have just popped in now, so it'll be great. So um, the first one I have is, is there a way to balance cortisol with food? Sometimes work stress gets in the way of riding joy, and I'm seeing, seeing it affect my performance over the years. Okay, yeah, great question. Um, so cortisol is an interesting one, obviously a stress hormone. Um, lots of things are going to impact how much cortisol you're producing. I'm not sure what the question is exactly related to food, but one thing I will point out is that low energy availability, not eating enough is a source of stress on the body. So don't underestimate that um, too, in terms of like, if you're trying to manage stress, again, just going back to the basics of making sure you're eating enough is a really effective way um, to manage stress. But there may be some opportunity for, um, you know, some other supports in there. So looking at caffeine intake, that one can also really have an impact um, on, on stress and stress hormones. Um, going long periods without food. So even if you're eating enough calories total for the day, but you're, you have long gaps without mm. food coming in through the day because of your busy schedule, that can be really stressful on the body too. So again, a perfect example of, we don't need to do anything fancy like hormone testing or anything. Probably it's more just like, let's strip it back. Let's look at the basics of your habits day to day, because there's probably something in there that um, we can tweak. It maybe isn't even a big change, but a small change that can really have an impact on just like the overall balance of, of your body and your hormone levels. Okay, great. Um, the next one is, uh, I think one of my general issues is that I've always felt I needed to avoid carbs because they mm -hmm. are not good for me, extra calories. But I guess I need extra calories for balance because I work very hard when I exercise. Yes, yeah, that conundrum, right? Like that whole don't eat carbs and all these ridiculous fad diets that take the totally. carbohydrates out, out, right? Yeah, I'm so glad whoever you are that shared that. I'm so glad you did share that because I'm certain that you're not the only one on this call that can relate to that. And I think it's so common. And I just want to just acknowledge um how common it is for people to have those beliefs. And it's not silly at all. Um, there's so much misinformation out there, so much fear mongering, especially around sugar and carbohydrates, mm -hmm. that it makes perfect sense that we think these things. And that's why I spend so much time talking about this is that um, carbs are really non negotiable when it comes to fueling yourself as an athlete. And, you know, the amount of women that I've worked with that are trying to get by on like, carbohydrate amounts, or like non-athletes and they think they're eating so much carbohydrate it's it would blow your mind mm -hmm. <laughs> right so if you're in that you have this like fearful relationship with carbs it makes sense you're not alone go slow okay right mm -hmm. if you're feeling like okay maybe i'll try this it makes sense maybe there's some merit here you don't have to go like more rice to dinner or having an extra snack that has a carbohydrate in it just go slow and use the feedback that your body is telling you like if you start feeling better during training or not needing it right um, but it might take Can you still hear me? I think we yeah, yeah. You, it, it was, it was, it's you frozen, and it was just kind of scrambled up a bit. But you were saying to go slow with the carbohydrate introduction, right? Yeah. So take it slow. You don't need to go from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. It could just be, you know, adding a bit more fruit, adding some juice, adding a half cup more pasta or rice to your dinner. Um, that will all kind of add up if you're doing it consistently. 
Perfect. And uh, the, the individual said, I'm hoping for more energy. So yes, I will try. Thank you so much for giving me permission. Amazing. Yeah. So that's so, that's okay. so nice. Um, the next question mm -hmm. is, are there any apps that you would recommend that are simple to use for nutrition tracking? Mm. I'm trying to think. Um, I know a lot of athletes will use my fitness pal. That seems to be a really popular one, mm -hmm. um, probably for use. I would just consider with any kind of nutrition tracking app, what your relationship with that data is like. For some people, it's very neutral. For other people, it's not very neutral. And so knowing what person you are, I think is really important to inform whether that is something that's going to be helpful for you or more harmful. Um, I'm not aware of too many or any really off the top of my head that don't really track calories. Um, so if that's a sticking point for you, it might just be best to stay away from those. Um, if it's not, by all means, there's so many out there. I think like, like I said, my fitness pal, um, mm -hmm. Chronometer is another one, um, that I've heard people use before, but just, just my biggest thing with those is pay attention to how you feel with using them. Pay attention to how your nutrition habits change when you're using them. Is it for the better or for the worse? Um, cause it can really go either way. Okay. Actually, someone just put in chronometer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so thank you. Okay. So next question. Yeah. I, I used to track old school with Excel when I was training and, um, yeah. yeah, I totally understand what you mean, but the relationship between the calories and what you're tracking. And then what does that do when you're mm -hmm. starting to like create and cook your own food? And then all of a sudden you're cutting back because of the calories. Right. So it's that, that yeah. tweak in your head to not yeah. associate it together. Um, Absolutely. I have a question from a coach. Um, I coach female athletes in the 14 to 25 years range. Uh, do nutritional needs change around the menstrual cycles? So how best can I accommodate influence this from a coaching perspective? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think this question is probably about just like different phases of the menstrual cycle cycle if I'm understanding that right and like if nutrition changes like through that monthly cycle if I not, would say so yeah me. yeah um, okay so um I think that has been again a hot topic that I've seen a lot on recently so I, I think I understand where the question is coming from to my knowledge there isn't any solid research to suggest that like training or nutrition really needs to change like through the monthly cycle that we may be um, experiencing some increased hunger possibly like during the, the, the menstrual cycle. Um, but other than that, I th things kind of need to just stay pretty consistent. There isn't really any changes that will be big enough to warrant concentrating on that, especially that age group too, when they're in that developmental phase. The, the basics that we covered today are really what we need to be working on with that group, building that foundation. Because um, sometimes focusing on those like really specific topics is a bit distracting from like the things mm. that they actually need to be working on. So um, totally great question. I would say you probably don't need to worry about that. Just work on building the foundations. <laughs> yeah, not McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, next question. Can you confirm you are sharing the presentation with the attendees? This was great. <laughs> yes happy to share the slides and I think it's being recorded too so it is being recorded so I will be sending the link and and we will share the resources afterwards everybody who's registered will get an email from me with with all the information um yeah. so next question would you have any suggestions or things to consider for female paracyclists with physical limitations or paralysis mm. Yes. Yeah, so for that, um, I think the biggest difference would be around hydration, possibly. Um, I know there can be some differences with sweat rates there for sure. So um, that is something you definitely want to probably get assessed, whether it's doing some like hydration testing to figure out what your unique sweat rate is. Um, because if we're not sweating as much and we're hydrating like we are sweating over hydration is just as dangerous as under hydration so definitely want to be figuring out um just individually what your needs are it's going to be again quite different person to person um sometimes digestion can also be a little different too highly individual though so really focusing on those like easy to digest foods if digestion is a little bit um sluggish or 
your digestion is just a bit upset. So again, like low fiber in those moments, more fluids maybe than solid foods potentially could be helpful. Um, I would say the biggest difference would be hydration. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then two last comments that are just kudos that I have to, to share. So the first is I'm a registered dietitian and an avid cyclist and rock climber. You did an amazing job on this topic. Thank you for yeah. such a sensible and simple approach. We'll definitely try the portable rehydration recipe. So that amazing. was a good one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Um, and then the next one was, thank you for sharing Alita, your knowledge on nutrition. So very critical to the success of our athletes while training, competing and for long-term health. And then they thanked me for organizing. So, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if in last call for questions, if anyone has any questions, um, but if not, um, I would say that thank you so much for sharing this tonight. This was great. I learned some more things too. So it's always valuable. I love every day that I get to learn. So um, thank you so much, Alita. And for everyone else who joined us tonight, thank you so much for taking time on a Monday night um, to join us. We will be sharing a link to the video. It will be posted on our website as well. And I will be sharing um, as many of the resources that we have. And just a reminder, we have four more, five more sessions coming up next week. We have Ride Editor Training with Amy Wade on Sunday night. We have um, uh, ride safety, uh, so know your rights with Rebecca Murray from The Biking Lawyer on Monday. And then next Tuesday, we have Allie Hodgson's from CSIO doing saddle health. Um, so that'll be a really good one. And then we're going to be finishing off our webinar series with Judy Goss, and she's going to be talking about creating a, an optimal environment for female athletes. So thank you so much, everyone. This has been great. And thank you so much, Alita. So much appreciation. Thank you for having me. Yeah, have a, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Night.